Hello, students of Johnson University's The, the, uh, the Fundamentals of Theology. Wrong class for a second there. Uh, I'm, all, as always, your lecturer, Dr. David Russell Mosley. Uh, so a couple things. One, if you hear things going on or if little ones pop up, those are just my kids, they're up. But I wanted to make sure that I got this made uh, as soon as possible. So uh, normally I will make these somewhere around Monday, Tuesday and get them up um, the same day when I can. Um, but I was just a little behind this week. Um, basically, these are extra little lectures that I'm not required to make that I make uh, just to keep us all engaged with one another. Now, just so you know, I have two different versions of this class going right now. Uh, and I'm going to be responding to things that have come up in both and then posting the same video in both places. So there may be things that maybe you didn't see come up on the forums or you didn't see or you didn't think about asking or anything like that. And it could just be that it's come up in a different, um, in a different version of this class. But anyway, there were uh, four basic things that I wanted to talk about today. So the first is to follow up a bit on our discussion of Aquinas. Um, a lot of you, a lot of you did really well with Aquinas, and and here's the thing: I expected all of you to falter a little bit, giving you as your first kind of written assignment based on your reading Aquinas. I knew what I was doing. Like, I knew that that was going to be difficult. So some of you did well with the idea of analogy. Some of you struggled with it. Some of you even went so far as to suggest that Aquinas is saying that we need to use equivocation, univocal language, uh, in order to talk about God, which is not what he's saying. So very briefly, Aquinas is saying that anytime we use language to talk about God, we're doing so by way of analogy. So if we were doing a... If we, we're doing it equivocally, this is what that would mean. Sorry, I have something on my mustache. Um, if I said that God is a lion and that Simba is a lion, if I were using that equivocally, that would mean that I'm talking about... <laughs> Which one of my kids now? I, I would mean that... Uh, I would mean two completely different things. What I meant by lion with God would mean something completely different. That I would, than what I meant uh, by lion with Simba, okay? If I were using that um, univocally, I'd mean exactly the same thing. So it, most likely I would mean that God is a thing that has fur and a mane and claws and teeth and a long tail and roars, okay? Analogically means I'm making a comparison between the two where they shared similar traits but are not exactly the same, but neither are they exactly different. Okay, so that's the first thing. The first thing that Aquinas says is that all language we use about God is analogical. The second thing he's saying is that we base all of our... All of our language has to come out of creation. Now, what he doesn't necessarily mean by that is that we're making comparisons like God is a lion. What he means is, since we are created, all of our examples, all of our ideas, all of our language is also created. So anytime we talk about God, we're using created ideas and ascribing them to God. But then Aquinas goes a step further and says that actually what's going on here, well, it might seem, so let's say, you know, I'm a father, I've got two kids sitting over behind you where you can't see them. Um, I'm a father, God is a father. Now what some people argue is that uh, we take our idea of fatherhood and we place it on God. What Aquinas says is the exact opposite. We get our very idea of fatherhood from the fact that God is the Father. And so basically this, this gets into something that wasn't in that particular reading but is elsewhere in Aquinas called participation. Uh, and basically what participation means is everything that exists receives its existence uh, by virtue of the fact that it participates in God. So all things participate in God. If it exists, it participates in God. And insofar as it participates in God, it, one, exists, two, is true, three, is good, four, is beautiful. Okay, and those three things, along with existence and like being and unity, are called the transcendentals. And so basically what that means is um, anytime we talk about a created thing, we're talking about something that participates in God and therefore tells us something about God in some way because it participates in him. And this is why we can make analogies. But it's also why it's an analogy, because God is a different kind of thing 
than we are, than any created thing is, because he is uncreated. Okay, if that doesn't make any sense, feel free to post comments in the, uh, post questions in the question forum, or um, send me a message. Second, a couple of you, I was really happy to see this, uh, noticed Irenaeus talking about the four Gospels and the four cherubim. Um, I think in that reading he relates it to Revelation specifically, but of course uh, in Revelation those four creatures are four individuated versions of the four-headed creatures that we encounter in Ezekiel. And so several of you asked, uh, is this true? That is, is the reason there are four Gospels because of the four cherubim uh, shown in Revelation, right? The one that looks like a man, the one that looks like an ox, the one that looks like a, a, an eagle, and the one that looks like um, a lion. I got those out of order. Man, ox, eagle, lion, yeah. Um, it's a complicated question to answer. If what you mean is that... Um, the gospel writers knew that they were one of those four, they were representing one of those four creatures, and that's why they wrote, well, maybe not. Um, but it is true that the incarnation has effects that reach throughout time, both into the past and into the future. And so the fact that uh, there came to be an association between the four gospels and the four uh, cherubim is, I think, is true. Now, that's, that's my opinion, um, and you are free to have a different one. Uh, that's my opinion. I think, yes, there is a real relationship there, and I think that we're not just theologizing. That is, so you could say that, well, we're just theologizing after the fact. We take the fact that there are four Gospels and the fact that there are these four creatures and we say, oh, there must be a relationship between the two, and go from there. Um, and we're just taking a coincidence and uh, kind of making it into something. I'm not sure that's the case, but one could make an argument in that way. Okay, uh, the second thing that came up for a couple of you was in the Apostles' Creed, dealing with the line, and he descended into hell. We don't have a lot of time to spend on this, um, but basically a couple of things to know about this. One, in the Greek the word is Hades. So you may have encountered um, translations of scripture uh, or in some of your uh, Bible classes if you've had some, uh, where it will tell you that the word Hades doesn't necessarily mean what we mean by the word hell. That more often the word Gehenna, which is a transliteration of a Hebrew word for the Valley of Hinnom, which is uh, Jerusalem's uh, dump, essentially their trash heap. Um, we'll tell you, okay, so Hades really means more like Sheol in the Old Testament, which just really means the abode of the dead. So it's really just another way of saying that Christ died. Um, of course, the problem with this is that Hades and Hades for sure, and possibly Sheol, have um, built into them the notion. Uh, have built into them this notion of stratification. That is, there are places where the where the really bad people go. Oh, you can't do the ones with. Hang on, sorry everyone. Okay, baby, just do a do a different one. You can't do this ones, okay? Uh, it's upstairs in your room, baby. Not right now. Uh, sorry about that. So anyway. Um, so, there's at least room for the possibility that when the author of the Apostles' Creed, or authors of the Apostles' Creed, traditionally they think it's the Twelve Apostles who wrote the Twelve Lines. Probably not true, because lines like that one didn't get added until the 4th century, um, but it's at least possible that the Apostles themselves were the origin for this. We don't know. Um, anyway, whoever wrote it... Uh, there's no guarantee that they weren't thinking of the fact that there are particular places where bad people go. Um, and it's tied to a passage, I don't remember which uh, letter of Peter it is, I want to say it's First Peter, uh, where it talks about Christ descending to the souls who disobeyed during the days of Noah. Um, and he proclaims the gospel to them. Good deal. We have... N 
there's no common sense reading of that passage that explains exactly what it means. Um, there are various different ways that we could interpret that passage. Um, you know, if you're taking into account some deuterocanonical stuff that uh, basically says that um, demons in the New Testament were actually like the giants, the sons of the Nephilim from the Old Testament who got disembodied, long argument. Um, maybe he's talking to them. Maybe he's talking just simply literally to the people who disobeyed during the days of Noah, which in that case, like why? And why not anyone else who died between the days of Noah and uh, the day Christ died? Uh, traditionally, this passage in the Apostles' Creed got interpreted to mean that Christ literally went to hell uh, and in some versions either led out uh, the pious Jews, so people like the patriarchs, Adam and Eve, is how Dante treats it in, um, in the Divine Comedy, um, or at the very least went down there to proclaim uh, to the, the damned in general, guess what? I won. So, uh, some, some modern interpreters, however, do see it just as descending it to the dead. And in fact, some modern translations reflect that. So, there's a non-concrete answer for you there as to what's going on in that particular passage. Lastly, someone brought up the question of biblical inerrancy and how it relates to uh, the scriptures being a source of authority. That's not really something that we have a lot of time to talk about in this particular class. That's something that would normally come up in, um, in a hermeneutics class, so some kind of uh, Bible, principles of Bible study type class. Uh, so I don't have a lot of, I don't have a lot of time to go into it and I don't really want to go into it because it's kind of beyond our purview, but basically biblical inerrancy can mean a couple of different things. Normally what biblical inerrancy means is the notion that there are no errors in the Bible. Now, what does that mean? For some people, it means there are literally no errors. Every, every, um, every pen stroke is there on purpose. The problem with that, of course, is, well, we don't have any of the original copies of these things, and in all the really old copies that we have anyway, um, the words aren't broken up. They're written in what's called um, mascules, and basically it's just a long block of text, uh, of letters, um, without, spaci without extra spacing between words, without punctuation, and basically this is because you would read them out loud, and um, a, native, a native speaker of Greek for the New Testament or Hebrew and Aramaic for the Old Testament would know where the breaks are supposed to come in. Um, so that's complicated, right? Because we don't have copies of those. So some people say they're inerrant in the originals and we just don't have the originals. Uh, some people mean uh, that they're inerrant in the sense that they tell us all of the truth about who God is, but that there are in fact errors in them. And we can see that to a certain extent. Um, Insofar as sometimes the history that it presents isn't always totally true, although I'll, some modern archaeology has overthrown things that we thought were wrong, that history in general thought, oh, well, the Bible got that wrong. And I was like, well, actually, maybe it didn't. Um, but, I mean, there are other things. Uh, for instance, and this is something that you'll see come up on, like, atheist websites of errors in the Bible, um, where it classifies bats as birds. That's not, okay. Now, that's not really an error. In the sense that it's just a different way of classifying flying animals. And they, since that was a flying animal, it's a bird. Uh, we say, well, it's a flying animal, but it's warm-blooded and doesn't have hollow bones and it gives live birth. So, not a bird. Right? Um, so, <sighs> biblical inerrancy, uh, I think the official definition that most restoration movement schools uh, follow has something like 17... Uh, things that it doesn't mean. Uh, and so, biblical inerrancy isn't something of profound importance for this class, insofar as we're going to, we start with the assumption that what the scriptures tell us about God is true. Um, and we don't spend a lot of time worrying about, is it inerrant? That is, are there any kind of errors of any sort whatsoever? We're just, we're starting at the baseline that what the scriptures say is true. Um, how it's true, what interpretive methods we might need to use, are things that we can talk about. Uh, but we're going to start with the assumption that it's true. 
Uh, and lastly, that is another thing. So inerrancy is something that would have been totally foreign to, say, ancient or medieval uh, theologians uh, and Christians, because inerrancy implies that the literal meaning of the text is the most important, whereas this is not the case for um, our ancient and medieval brothers and sisters in Christ. For them, scripture has at least four potential meanings, uh, a literal, which means what the words actually say, so that can include genre differences, um, but the literal, the allegorical, which would be a spiritual meaning, um, the anagogical, the typo and the um, tropological. Uh, the anagogical deals with, um, gotta see if I get these right, I believe the anagogical deals with um, Christ and like the new heavens and new earth, and the tropological is morality. I could have those backwards. Anyway, okay. So those are the things that I wanted to make sure I talked about. Um, I'll probably be making another one of these for this week based on your... Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm posting this in Unit 3. We're currently in Unit 2. Um, I'll probably make another one in Unit 3 for the Unit 2 stuff that comes up. All right. God bless everybody. I look forward to seeing both your Unit 2 stuff, which I haven't seen. I mean, I've responded to you uh, so far. I haven't read your papers yet. You haven't submitted them yet. Uh, and I look forward to your Unit 3 stuff as well. All right. God bless, and I'll see you next time.